um, thank you all. I should say, just um, apropos of what David mentioned, uh, I, I do want to say thank you uh, to anybody here who I haven't managed to say thank you uh, personally to yet. We were inundated with um, emails and letters and uh, very thoughtful um, uh, and messages of encouragement, which really meant an awful lot to me and to all the others who were kind of on the front line in the um, recent referendum. So thank you all and thank you for turning out in such numbers tonight as well. I've never really liked post-mortems and this one is, it has to be said, particularly depressing for anyone who cares about justice, for anyone who cares about the protection of innocent human life and indeed freedom of conscience. But I have been asked to speak to you about the referendum, so I will. First, I want to reflect on the referendum, how it was won and its significance. Next, I want to preview some of the legal and political battles uh, that face us, particularly those in relation to conscience rights. And finally, I'll ask the question, where to from now on? So, how to reflect on the referendum. I found myself returning to this thought time and again. When it comes to self-congratulation, the Irish body politic may just be peerless. The media and the politicians delight in reminding us how educated and how astute the Irish voter is. Scarcely a day goes by in which they do not applaud our ability to withstand the rampant forces of populism that have been unleashed, so we are to believe, in the territories of many of our neighbours, particularly Britain and the US. They chuckle at the naivety and stupidity of those who voted for Brexit or for Donald Trump. We, the media and our political class, reassure us, are much too clever to fall victim to the mindless demagoguery of the populists. In its traditional use, the word populism has tended to denote an appeal to the concerns of ordinary people over elites. However, in its current usage, populism, which as I say is invariably a term of abuse, generally note, denotes an appeal to people's baser <coughs> rather than higher instincts, to emotion rather than reason, to prejudice over weighing the evidence. Importantly, it also generally involves the identification of an enemy group whose members are regularly vilified and maligned, a them to our us. This is what is sometimes referred to as othering, if I may be permitted to borrow a term from feminism and identity politics. When it comes to the outcast group, the objective is that right-thinking members of society don't even need to go to the bother of giving serious, or any, in fact, consideration to what they have to say. Their status alone is sufficient justification for rejecting it. Now, if that, in a nutshell, is populism, then I have some bad news for our media and the vast majority of our political class. They are the populists. The recent referendum debate shows it. How was the referendum won? It was won through an appeal to emotion over reason, to prejudice over weighing the evidence, and it was won by othering those who are pro-life, by blackening their name and portraying them as heartless, unbending moralists who are content to see women die. Let's look for a moment at the appeal to emotion over reason. A very good example of this was to be found in the deliberate editorial decision on the part of RTE as to how it would cover the referendum campaign. The decision was that the national broadcaster would focus not on reasoned debate 
or argument, but on personal stories, on testimonies from individuals. In short, what in a different era used to be called tabloid journalism. Why bother with the dry and dusty facts and legalese of the proposed legislation when you can have a colour piece? Is it that RTE thought its viewers and listeners too dull to comprehend rational debate? But then that would be at odds with the self-congratulation I mentioned earlier. Could it be something else that drove them to this editorial decision? It is true, of course, that RTE did host some debates towards the end of the campaign, which were, in fairness, balanced, unlike TV3's effort. But radio and television programmes in the weeks and months prior to the vote delivered a consistent diet of heart-tugging individual stories. This was a much longer-term project, which was reflected in the general editorial decision regarding the campaign coverage. You see, dealing with the issue of abortion predominantly by reference to individual stories inevitably feeds into a narrative of choice. It does this because it excludes from consideration or even discussion that there might be an objective moral standard that killing unborn children is wrong. A standard which exists whether or not people choose to follow it. So many of these stories involved people saying, in effect, abortion was the right choice for me. <clears throat> as against this narrative, what RTE presented as the counterpoint, that is to say, a story from someone who chose not to have an abortion, merely supports the implicit idea that everyone should be free to choose what's right for them. That, of course, is the essence of the pro-choice argument. Hence, the coverage, even if occasionally or superficially fair, could not help but favour that side. It is the complete validation of moral relativism. In answer to this, it's simply no use to allow those who actually chose life to explain that their choice was good for them. The moral question is whether choosing death for one's child is a bad thing, even if the person choosing it happens to think it is good. The fact that the media focused so much of their attention on the hardest of hard cases meant that this question could never really be asked. The pain of the parents rendered them immune to questioning. They were surrounded by an emotional force field that deflected any questions about whether it's morally defensible to deliberately take measures to accelerate the death of a sick child. And framing the debate in this way was doubly unfair, as not only did it exclude the moral issue in question and its legal implications for our society from consideration, but also it did not truly hear the other side. There is another personal story that was not heard, that could never be heard, that of the baby. As RTE well knew, dead babies tell no tales. They were not present to tell the viewers or listeners whether abortion was the right choice for them. In this, as in much else in life, out of sight is out of mind. The contrast with how RTE and other outlets covered the story about the tomb babies is illuminating. The extraordinary levels of indignation that people like our Minister for Children are capable of achieving in relation to the burial arrangements of poor infants who, it appears on the basis of the evidence so far available, were not deliberately killed, stands in marked contrast to the lack of concern for the fate of unborn children who are to be deliberately killed today. <laughs> Politicians do not have the power to save those babies that sadly died years ago, but they do have the power to do something about infants in utero today. And what they decided to do was to join a campaign 
the consequence of which is that children like those who were housed in tomb years ago, some of whom died and some of whom lived, are simply never born at all. And what's left of their bodies is to be disposed of in a domestic toilet or the waste facility of a hospital rather than a septic tank. This, we're told, is progress. While warning against the use of emotive language, the Taoiseach could not resist the temptation to refer to the long and lonely journeys made to England by women seeking abortions. And so this helped to depict, again, those who adopt a principled stance uh, against abortion, a pro-life position, as lacking in compassion. The Taoiseach, however, was allowed to ignore the hapless victims who never made the journey back. The government and the media persisted in peddling the ludicrous lie that the Catholic Church in Ireland represents the establishment which they, with the bravery of a D-Day soldier, dared to confront. Now, it may have once been the case that there were adverse consequences for challenging the church in Ireland, but that has not been the case in my lifetime, and I regret to inform you that I am no spring chicken. <laughs> The church and Catholics were presented as the shadowy cabal of puppet masters trying by nefarious means to impose their views on people yearning and striving for freedom. What rot. The failings and abuses of the church, which by the way sicken me and all decent Catholics, were were constantly exhumed and warmed over for the purpose of dismissing anything that any Catholic might have to say about anything at all, and implying that lay people who are just as appalled as anyone else must be somehow secret supporters of abuse. And this allowed anyone espousing a pro-life viewpoint, whether they happen to be Catholic or not, to be identified as the enemy as outside the bounds of decent society, as other. Why should we listen to you? After all, you're a Catholic, or you take the same position as the Catholic Church. The moral issue is thereby neatly sidestepped. We don't take lessons in morals from the likes of you. The pro-life position depends on its integrity, for its integrity, on the principle that all human life is valuable no matter how precarious or fragile or short that life may be. It depends on the principle that no one gets to decide whose life has value and whose does not. It depends on the principle that we have a duty as individuals when the issue arises for us personally and as a society more generally, to see to it that as far as possible no one is deprived or robbed of his or her life because of the choices of someone else. David has often written and spoken of how the horror of our age subsists in the unchosen burden. This is how we have come to view people who are vulnerable and in need of our help. So much for the populist tactics. But while the politicians and media played a one-sided game that has left at least a third of the population feeling disenfranchised, the hard truth of the matter is that the majority of Irish people just didn't care enough about the child in the womb, or indeed his mother. They were sick of hearing about abortion. They just wanted the issue to go away. In the end, they opted to repeal the Eighth Amendment and to wash their hands of the whole affair. Did they understand the legislation? Did they understand the implications for medicine in this country? Did they understand the cultural implications? The gory reality of abortion? Almost certainly not going on the exit polls. In short, they preferred blissful ignorance. You see, people have become apathetic to the plight and suffering involved for unborn <coughs> children in an abortion. They've also become apathetic to the plight of women who are considering abortion and would prefer that they just had the abortion, got it over with, and stopped complaining. In addition, stirred up by a hostile and corrupt media, 
they came to hate those who they had been told to hate, namely people like us. Never mind that we were engaged in <coughs> civil, a debate in a civil and respectful way. Never mind that we were the ones saying, don't kill human beings. Never mind that they kept shouting intolerance at us while calling us names and shouting us down. We were cast as the scapegoats on which to pin the ills of the world and the anger of people who do not know what they're angry about. The scene was set, scripted by broadcasters and journalists with editorial support, and the actors were brought in to act their part. All of this was done to achieve their goal, to strip the most innocent of human beings of their rights so that they could be legally killed. No one can deny that, and funnily enough, no one does. They just keep calling us names and saying that we're offensive, though it is they who have caused the ultimate offense, the dehumanization of certain human beings. And with this referendum, I fear that a Rubicon has been crossed. For unborn children, the protection of the law is gone, and it is unlikely to be won back in this generation. They are the first class to be affected, and they're unlikely, sadly, to be the last. I think our chief role over the next few years, in terms of public debate at least, <clears throat> will be simply to be seers and prophets, previewing and predicting what will happen. We need to be the voice that nobody wants to hear. We need to point out the intent of those who wish to legalize and make available widespread abortion. We need to tell them all what will happen before it does. At least then, people can't say they weren't warned. But it seems that this current crop of politicians, much like during the Celtic Tiger years, aren't willing to listen to dissenting voices and would rather cast them out into the wilderness and simply ignore their concerns. Nevertheless, let's preview some of the legal and political battles ahead. I want to begin by looking at the issue of freedom of conscience because I believe that what is proposed has significant ramifications, not just for doctors, but for society as a whole, for civil liberties and for human rights. Many of you will be well aware of what it is that the government is proposing that a doctor, nurse, or midwife will be able to opt out of directly uh, participating in or carrying out an abortion. But other hospital workers who may, not who may have an objection to facilitating an abortion, such as porters, secretaries, and so on, will not have that protection. Furthermore, as regards doctors who attempt to exercise their freedom to choose to have no part in abortion, they will be forced, in effect, to facilitate it by referring a woman to a doctor who will carry out the abortion. This is an affront to the notion of freedom of conscience, and it is utterly oppressive. As I said before, real oppression subsists not merely in doing unjust things, but in requiring others to participate in doing unjust things. And this oppression culminates in forcing people to do things they find morally repugnant against their will. The legislation gives the illusion of respecting conscience while doing nothing of the sort. It forces everyone to play a part in the system of abortion, thus making it more difficult to apportion blame. When everyone's involved, no one is blameless, and therefore no one will complain or try to put a break on it. It's also obvious to anyone with eyes that the point of all this is not to ease access for women to abortion, which could be catered for by abortion clinics or an internet list of doctors who are willing to carry out these so-called services but rather the point is to dissuade anyone who might have a conscientious objection from raising it. The point is to target pro-life doctors, exposing them to opprobrium and financial disaster. 
eventually nobody will object. Like the bake the cake bigot cases in Northern Ireland and in the US, where activists <coughs> shopped for their wedding confectionery in the only Christian bakery in town, abortion activists will present in suspected pro-life doctor's surgeries asking for abortions in the hope that they will refuse to refer. And once they do, the activists will report them to the authorities and try to ruin them. And just like in the cake cases, where the couple simply crossed the street to the next baker to buy their cake in another shop, once the GP refuses to refer, the activist will simply go to another GP, whom she knew from the outset would have no objection to obtain the pills she seeks. The abortion will be carried out, and as a fringe benefit, a bigoted GP will be exposed. And as the masterpiece cake shop case in the US demonstrates, these people are persistent. Having been roundly criticized by the US Supreme Court for its treatment of the Christian baker at the center of the dispute, it seems that the Colorado Civil Rights Commission is now going after him again this time because he declined to make a bespoke gender transi transition cake. So what can we take from all of this? Well, if you're a young Christian in Colorado, you might think twice about becoming a baker. <laughs> Similarly, those in this country with an objection to killing babies before they're born might think twice about becoming a doctor or nurse. And so the only people left in medicine will be those willing to take an innocent life. Just to look at some of the proposals of the legislation, because this is, I suppose, moving in real time now. Um, there was an Oireachtas uh, committee hearing yesterday. We pointed out that during the, ref during the referendum <coughs> that once constitutional protection was removed for children before they're born, their rights, if any, would be subject to the whim of the Oireachtas. We predicted that the status of unborn children would change, that they would come to be seen as subhuman or non-persons whose rights are contingent on the wishes of their mothers, or indeed <coughs> the opinion of a doctor. We see that already coming true. Since May, Simon Harris has published an updated draft of the Heads of Bill he published in advance of the referendum. In it, the definition of viability has been changed so that it is now defined as the point in pregnancy at which, in the reasonable opinion of a medical practitioner, the fetus is capable of survival outside the uterus without extraordinary life-saving measures. Now, what is viability when left to the reasonable opinion of a medical practitioner? What are extraordinary life-saving measures? To me, extraordinary life-saving measures are what doctors engage in every day in hospitals all over this country, particularly for newborns. We can predict where all this will go if left to the opinion of a doctor who is a pro-choice ideologue. It will mean whatever it pleases him to mean. Probably up to 30 weeks, maybe more in the case of some children. My own baby was born at 35 weeks and was mechanically ventilated for a week, undoubtedly an extraordinary life-sustaining measure. We always knew that some doctors regarded themselves as God. This is taking it to a whole new level. <coughs> With regards to head five and six of the bill, there is, again, as we pointed out, no gestational limit. This was hotly contested by certain activists on the other side of the debate, and indeed by certain broadcasters who implied we were lying. And yet, there it is in black and white on the department's website. Even the Irish Times has acknowledged this in an article in July of this year. Head 6 deals with what was dishonestly called fatal fetal abnormality during the campaign. Why do I say dishonestly? because it is not what the government are proposing. There is no requirement that the child 
actually be terminally ill or have a fatal condition, even if it were possible for a doctor to predict that at all. All that is required is that there is a likelihood that the child would die. This was never properly debated during the campaign, and it seems Harris is dead set on avoiding any debate on it again. Nevertheless, he's now changed the wording from regarding a, con a condition affecting the fetus that is likely to lead to the death of the fetus, either before or shortly after birth, to either before or within 28 days of birth. And again, as we predicted, this is just for starters, and it hasn't even, the actual wording of the legislation hasn't even been tabled yet. Already there was a paper published during the summer by Murray Denwright, Fiona DeLongos, and others seeking to expand the scope of this provision. These nice ladies, in calling the 28-day limit problematic, actually said the following, the litigation clearly excludes cases where the fetus's life expectancy after birth is short, a matter of months or years, but not as short as 28 days. So they're actually willing to say, recognize that a child might live for years, but should come under this heading. They go on to say that clinical guidelines should clarify that in the case of severe fetal diagnosis, whatever that means, where it is not likely the baby will die, but there's an independent risk of serious harm to the pregnant person's health, termination should be permitted. In other words, one should be allowed to abort a baby, presumably with a disability, because not to do so might pose a risk to the woman's, or I mean pregnant person's, health. <laughs> the apprehension of stress at having a disabled child should itself be enough to obliterate that child's rights and warrant his or her death. And what is amazing about all this is the dishonesty with which its proponents, <coughs> proponents seek to disguise the eugenic aspect of this provision. And the dishonesty of the media never test them on this and never ask difficult questions. This morning I read the paper delivered by Peter Boylan and Kleena Murphy of the Irish um, College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. <coughs> the section entitled Fetal Medicine TOP termination of pregnancy or fetal abnormality was most interesting. There was one sentence that jumped out at me. Currently TOP for fetal abnormality takes place outside the state. Currently. This is from the same doctor who insisted that repeal of the A would not usher in abortion in the case of disability. And here we have them preparing the way for it requesting MRIs to better diagnose fetal abnormalities or children with illnesses or disabilities, as we like to call them. Remember that all of this comes under the heading, their heading, TOP for fetal abnormality. So we can see where they're going with this one. The tragedy is that there has been certain organizations who purport to represent people with disabilities who are calling for the same, <coughs> the right to abort disabled babies. You couldn't make it up. Meanwhile, let me say, there are many parents of children with disabilities and people with disabilities who are disgusted at these organizations for the stance they have taken and the way they have been playing into the hands of those who seek to brand them as unfit to be born because of the burden they place on their parents. If that's the approach we're going to take, all children are burdens. There's no child that doesn't cause worry or stress at some point in his life for his parents, either because of illness or difficulty or bad behavior or selfishness or any number of challenging things that can happen in the ordinary development of a human being. And that is the crux of it. The pro-choice view does regard all children as burdens, though some more than others. This is the total opposite of the pro-life approach, and may I say, Christian view, in which parents see their children as blessings, no matter what life may throw at them. Sadly, 
the Irish people in the recent referendum chose to side with the children of Arboretans worldview. We said that these children would come to be regarded as the property of their mothers, which is ironic given that it is feminists who rightly complained for years that women were treated as the chattels of their husbands or fathers. And so it came to pass in yesterday's Iraq this hearing when supposedly civilized adults sat to discuss the mechanisms of how they would cater for the deaths of between 3,000 and 5,000 children each year. The big concern was to have adequate resourcing for doctors to do this. Investment in ultrasound was critical, said Peter Boyle. Again, this was something we raised during the campaign, that GPs weren't equipped nor trained in ultrasound, nor would have the resources or facilities to scan women and keep them for observation. We pointed out the dangers for women in not having these things in place. But we were told we were scaremongering. In fact, a senior consultant obstetrician actually said during the course of the referendum campaign that scanning wasn't necessary to date of pregnancy, that she and other colleagues could do it on clinical examination. And this is simply impossible in the first trimester. And even after the first trimester, there's a margin of error. Now Peter Boylan says that ultrasound facilities are essential and that the consequences of getting it wrong are very serious. And now that he says the same thing as we were saying, they all stop to listen. But nobody in the media has stopped to question the scandalous proposal to invest massively in ultrasound machines for the termination industry when there are maternity hospitals up and down this country without such resources and mothers and babies who need them. The complete and utter disregard for the child in the room was evident throughout. The child is no longer a person whose rights should be considered at all before birth. And the ink was barely dry on the President's signature repealing the Eighth Amendment. We also saw how the call uh, by, the, by Peter Boylan on behalf of the uh, College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists that the 72-hour waiting, uh, 72 waiting period should be scrapped because this was paternalistic. And he said that there was evidence that those who request termination remain satisfied with their decision. As far as I can see, nobody asked him to produce that evidence or say where he got it, but nonetheless, they accepted it. In terms of um, how we are cast compared to those on the pro choice side, I think fear that things will only continue and get worse. For instance, yesterday, I think Dr. Mary Favier was interviewed and was introduced as Vice President of the uh, IGC, uh, ICGP, but there was no mention of her credentials as a long-time pro-choice activist and heavily involved with Doctors for Choice. This is in marked contrast to how the media deals with us. We are branded forever with any past campaigning. Most media circles feel it necessary to warn the public in advance that we are deplorables, <laughs> even if we're just talking about the weather. <laughs> so in terms of engaging with public debate, we can rest assured that there will be none. The Taoiseach, the Minister for Health and other politicians have shown complete disregard for anyone who voted against abortion. We know that the media will not facilitate any real debate and that if a pro-life person is invited onto a programme, which almost certainly will be unfairly weighted against them. They will be there to play the role of the pantomime villain or villainess, to be shouted and berated, to be the whipping boy, taking the punishment and distracting people's attention from the real corruption within. Not only is this alliance of pro-choice advocates, politicians and media already blatantly attempting to make access to abortion easier and more widespread, but Minister Harris yesterday promised that it would be free before it's even reached the office for debate. Free abortion in a country where if you have a sick child or are suffering from cancer, you have to pay through the nose for essential treatment. to save your child, but they'll pay to kill your child. Strike that, they'll get us to pay for the killing. 
How did this monstrous thing happen? We voted it in. We voted these politicians into power. <clears throat> and that's what we need to reflect on in the future. If Harris's proposal bother you, and I think they should, then Fine Gael must be punished in the next election. Yes. 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 You may say, well, there's no difference anymore between the various political parties. And you'd be right. That is true. But we have to start somewhere. And Fine Gael needs to feel it. If you don't want to see a regime more permissive than that in the UK in operation here, then you must make them feel your displeasure. Yeah. It's high time the media were made to feel it too. If you feel not only politically disenfranchised, but also culturally disillusioned, then stop buying the papers. Stop subscribing. <laughs> Stop subscribing to hostile outlets that hate you. Yeah. Turn off the radio, turn off the television, throw it out if you miss it. If enough of us do this, eventually they'll have to take note, even if only out of self-interest. Listen to some edifying music, go and watch a good film, tune into alternative media. The world is a smaller place these days, thanks to the internet, and it's much easier to access quality journalism from other outlets that are not so prejudiced and insular as our national media in this country. Yeah. And then, start trying to save lives. Not just the lives of babies who might otherwise be lost to abortion, but the lives of their parents, siblings, families, and communities that might just benefit from the talents they might have to bring to that community. Start earnestly teaching your own children about the value and dignity of every human life so that when their turn comes, they will know how to vote, how to act, and how to support and love others. Support others who also believe in the intrinsic worth of every human being, even those we don't like, even those who hate us and would attack us and our way of life. If you're a Christian, you will know that we all have a common heritage. We are all children of God even government ministers. <laughs> if you're not, you will nonetheless recognize the importance of treating everyone as deserving of the protection of the law against attack, the value of every human life. Without that recognition, we know what will happen. Life becomes cheapened. Unwanted babies become disposable before they're born. Wanted babies enjoy the protection of the law only insofar as they are the property of their parents. Born babies and human beings at the other end of life will be next. There are already many advocating for euthanasia, both for the very old and the very young. Children who missed the abortionist's implements by chance because their conditions weren't diagnosed until after birth how long before they too will have no escape after birth, if they are also seen as an unwanted burden. That's what awaits us. It's depressing. It's tempting to feel terrible and justified anger. But as someone reminded me recently, the anger of God, the anger of man, worketh not the justice of God. Do what you can in your own life, in your own area. Start small. Small efforts are not to be dismissed or scorned, even if you feel overwhelmed by the culture around you. So, save one life if you can. And if you save one life, then you will have saved the whole world. Thank you.